welcome to Sheep Stuff You Should Know with Dan Macon and Ryan Mahoney here. And you're coming from, I'm from Rio Vista, California. And where are you broadcasting from today, Dan? I am from sunny Auburn, California today, up in the Sierra foothills. Excellent. Weather's good up there. You get any rain? Oh, my word. We had, uh, in the last 48 hours, we've had over two and a half inches of rain. Wow. We had hail, we had power outages. We were just waiting for the locusts to come, you know, yeah. kind of storms. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys get any rain? Uh, we got like a half to uh, eight tenths. So not, not a whole bunch. The feed's so dead here, it doesn't help anything. It won't help our rangeland feed at all. It'll, you know, it, it caught us up on irrigated pasture, which was nice, but, but it, it uh, washed out the, the rangeland feed. So it'll grow some good star thistle. That's all right. We'll, we'll yeah, get... yeah, the morning glory and star yeah. thistle. That... Yeah, exactly. you, get, you get the morning glory growing up in your area? We do, yep. Have you ever run into those morning glory balls where they, the fiber gets balled up in the gut? We've never had any problem with it. Um, we don't have it real thick because we, you know, I think it, it probably, you guys probably grow more of it than we do. Um, have you had problems with it? Yeah, we had. So there's one, one year we had a set of ewes um, down at, at where I was lambing out and we just had them where they would just all of a sudden just start dropping condition and then they would die and we couldn't figure out what it was. It wasn't a pneumonia. It wasn't, you know, sometimes they'd end up dying maybe of pneumonia when you got a meat crop seed, but we couldn't figure yeah. it out. And the labs don't really test for it or look for that when they're doing the meat crop seeds. And then finally we had one and it had a lamb and so and so I ended up going and pulling the lamb and as I pulled the lamb out there was these bumps in the intestine that I could feel from the uterus and you could feel these knots and so then I ended up working one of them out and it was the size of a you know between a tennis ball and a golf ball of just this compact hard rock that was just oh, how weird. fiber tightened up it was one of the most amazing things I ever seen and it's what it was. It was the, it's the vines. They can't, can't break down the fiber in those vines and just wrap up into a ball and plug the gut. So, I've, I have a, a friend and colleague who has done her whole life's research on bindweed. I'm going to have to, I always tease her about that. And I'll, I'll have to tell her I have new respect for the work that she's done now. That's yeah, I, I have a video yeah. of it somewhere. Of that's the, that's actual, wild. Yeah, I'll have to get that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good. So we were going to start talking about some, some marketing issues today, but uh, we've both kind of been watching the, the developments in this coronavirus um, food assistance program or CFAP that's rolling out here um, in the next week or so. And, and you guys have been doing quite a bit of research on how it might provide some, um, some relief in terms of your operation. So what, what are you guys finding out about it, Ryan? Yeah, so it's a it's a relief program. I mean, some people that I've talked to are disappointed it's not enough. Other people are excited at what it is. Um, there are two, well, there are three factors that affect the sheep industry. Number one, which is the easiest uh, to explain, is wool. Mm -hmm. And you either take your wool on hand inventory as of January 1 or January 15, 2020, or 50% of your 2019 production. And then you'll hope, then you can apply and receive a payment, potentially receive a payment of 37 and a half cents for greasy white wool and 74 and a half cents for graded clean basis wool. Uh, so that's one. The other two aspects uh, deal with uh, the livestock side mm -hmm. and there are there's a lot of programs for a ton of different commodities especially the small commodities um because this coronavirus has hit things so isolatedly and so yeah. targetedly that it's it's kind of it's good that it's as broad as it is but uh, there's cattle there's a cattle aspect that our business is looking into but then there's also this uh sheep side and so this this breaks down and applies to lambs and yearlings, which is defined as all sheep less than two years old. So that would include a long yearling from the yeah. previous year that you retained or an old cropper 
uh, yearling lamb that you were forced to hold on to longer than the intended marketing date. Mm -hmm. um, if you market it, you get a payment for all, uh, all lambs or all sheep less than two years old that were marketed between January 15th and April 15th. The payment is 33 bucks a head. Okay. And then you, the, the second piece of that, which is the third part is you take self-selected inventory on hand any day between April 16th and May 15th. And you will get $7 per head for all sheep less than two years old that you had on hand during one day during that time frame. Okay. Now, the, from what I understand, the FSA is being trained right now. This training starts tomorrow and goes through the middle of next week. The applications open up around the 27th of May. So um, contact your FSA office, but they're probably getting swamped right now. So get in line, contact the FSA office. Um, and in the meantime, I would prepare your records so that way you can prove what you have and, and kind of try to anticipate what they're going to request and expect them to request something different. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would look into that and, and that's going to be some welcome relief to a really hard hit industry in the sheep. So between the wool and that, and, and really I got to tip my cap to um, ASI. They, they really, they really worked hard to, to get this assistant for us, assistance for us. I think there was a lot of disappointment in the industry during the trade negotiations on the hit that the wool and the, the skins took. Yep. And a lot of that was um, pushed back on the ASI and the trade organization. But um, they really, when this COVID struck, they really, they took an all hands on deck approach. And I was completely impressed with the job they did uh, working with, producers to the politicians and everybody in between. I, I really do need to, you got to give credit where credit's due and, and really they did a really good job. And it's an industry, it's a bottom up organization. So that means that the sheep people in the country were, were asking for this, but they really did a good job um, representing our interests well. So uh, I think that's a really good point too. And I, I think just, um, you know, I was on a webinar that the USDA did last week and the changes in what, what has come out in this written rule with what they were anticipating really show that the sheep folks um, were, were heavily engaged in that whole conversation. And I, I think that's, that's really encouraging. So do you have to have an established relationship with your farm service agency um, office already, or can you go in there cold and, and start working with them on this? Um, <laughs> you should have a working relationship with your FSA office. <laughs> Um, and I know you probably, I don't want to say you can't go in cold turkey, but if you have not talked to your FSA officer in a long time, and a lot of sheep operations are nomadic where they'll go from ranch to ranch, so they don't have land payments. Yeah. Um, I would go in and I would meet with the officer because the worst thing that could happen is they could say, no, you don't get any money and you don't qualify for anything. But the best thing that could happen is they could pay you up to $250,000. Right. So, so right. it's worth trying, I guess. Yep. The upside is upside is there. I think, you know, part of the challenge for us up in the foothills is that they've closed all of our FSA offices. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think our closest now are Elk Grove or Yuba City. And it uh, sounds like I'll be I'll be making a trip to the valley here in the next week or so. Yeah, at least one. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, the other the other factors that uh kind of go into play if they have an eligibility requirement um the payment is limit is, there is a payment limitation of two hundred fifty thousand per person or entity for all commodities combined applicants who are corporations llcs or limited partnerships may qualify for additional payments where members actively provide personal labor or personal management for the farming operation producers will also have to certify they meet the AGI uh, limitation of $900,000 unless 75% or more of their income is derived from farming, ranching, or forestry related activities. Producers also must be in compliance with highly erodible land and wetland conservation provi provisions. And so that's where that those provisions are where the working relation with the FSA right. helps. Right. But 
Um, that doesn't mean that you're not operating within compliance of those provisions and would mm -hmm. be disqualified if you don't. You can always get into compliance. Right. And a lot of times it's just going in and signing up. It's not changing your operation to come into compliance. Well, I think that's a, that's a really good, uh, good way to kick this off. It's nice to have some positive news with all the stuff that's been going on. And, and uh, thank well, you for all right. <laughs> doing all that research. That's outstanding. Yeah. Well, we have an interest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 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 So uh, if, if you're good, I want to kind of dive into some of the, the, a couple of the questions that I've had over the last week. And I, I think this is, um, this is an area where the differences in how we market are probably um, going to come to the fore a little bit. I think your your experience in the land market is so much beyond anything I've ever done. I'm, I'm really looking forward to asking you these questions. But uh, we we both kick the term around fat lambs a lot, um, and that's something you hear in the market a lot and you're in the industry. But I'm curious what you mean by a fat lamb. What is a fat lamb for our Amy livestock size wise? Finish wise, what does that mean? Yeah, so fat lamb is a market lamb or <clears throat> something that's ready to go to town to sell and become edible product. Um, there's a lot of ways to measure that. The most important measure by far is yield grade. All lambs, when they get processed through USDA facilities uh, or the main facilities are graded on a yield grade basis, that is basically, it's a measurement of the back fat cover. Um, and then also uh, they do look at the inside flank streaking and things like that on the inside. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes up with a yield grade. Uh, yield grade two is perfect. Yield grade three is good. Yield grade four is over fat. Yield grade five or five plus is way over fat. Yield grade ones are too lean, and then um, they'll have uh, they can do railers or no rolls. Those mm -hmm. are ones that are too emaciated, too great. Okay. So um, okay. there's a lot of a lot of uh, proper um, opinions and a lot of uh, misinformed opinions on whether one yield grade, like a yield grade four or a yield grade one, which one is worse for the industry. What is the cause of market crashes and all these things. It's really easy to blame the weight of lambs and not look at the finish of lambs. And then there's, there's challenges within that question too. So you have a couple factors at play that bring value to this fat lamb. The first one is you have a plant that's trying to maximize their efficiency. So they wanna produce the most pounds of product possible per overhead cost. So if they're running a 55 pound carcass through their line or a 75, 85 pound carcass through their line, it costs them exactly the same to process that product. So if you can take and increase that weight to the efficient point, that that's a driver to push the weight up because they can make more money because they have more sellable pounds of meat at the end, which helps their efficiency. The flip side of that, is as you get bigger, you have to trim more. Mm -hmm. So you have to trim things down and you have product that's going from getting sold at $16.99 in a loin to getting trimmed off and selling for 32 cents into a, you know, as a mixer into a grind or something along those lines. So that's a pressure to push the, the yield grade down, not necessarily the weight, the yield grade down. Right. The weight gets pulled down because of packaging size more than anything. So if you're doing a, uh, if you're putting lamb chops into the best examples, legs, right? So if you're going to take a leg steak and you're going to put it in a pre-packaged, pre-sized box and that leg comes in from a 220 pound lamb, might be a yield grade two, but that leg steak won't fit in that box. Therefore, it can't get sold into that product line. So they have to develop a new market to do that. The other problem with those really big, big lambs is you're gonna take that leg and maybe on a 55, 65 pound carcass, you have a, 
uh, $40 entry point or $50 entry point on what it costs to buy that in the store. Well, all of a sudden you stick one from a 210 pound lamb right there in that door. You're looking at an $80 entrance <laughs> and what shopper is going to go and look and say, Oh, I'm going to spend $80 for my meal when I have an option of a, you know, a tri-tip roast or some of these yeah. other proteins at a cheaper entry point. So yeah. those, that's a downward pressure on the weight. And there's never one, <clears throat> You talk to, there. if you look at a plant, that plant will probably have a specific size that really works well for them. But no plant, I would say, is the same. And that's because they're all built differently. Their fab floors are differently. They're delivering into different markets. And um, the, uh, the customer base in both or the customer profile in plants are different. So what one wants is different from what another wants. Um, for us, Amy Livestock, we try to raise 150 to 160 pound lamb average throughout the year. That means we'll send some 120 pound uh, Willamette Valley lambs that we buy, and they'll be yield grade twos right off the grass, but they'll be a 60, you know, 120 is a 60 pound carcass. And then we have others that'll be 180 pounds. They're gonna be crossbred Suffolk's really big frame type sheep. They'll be yield grade twos right off the grass at 165, 70 pounds. And then, but the average for the whole year, what we like to look for is 150 to 60 pound weight average. But the biggest driver is never the weight. The biggest driver is always yield grade. We wanna have the right kind of finish on those lambs because that has more effect on, we feel it has more effect on the flavor of the lambs is the intermuscular fat and the fat cover. And, um, and then just in the quality of product, if you can have everything be yield grade twos, you know exactly how much trim you need to cut off. You have exactly how that's going to fit into a package. And you may have a larger loin eye or a smaller loin eye, but that product's going to be very similar. So we always try to drive through your grade. How do you know looking at a, at a pen of lambs or a, a, lamb, a group of lambs out on pasture, kind of what their fat cover is going to look like? Is that, is that just experience and looking at, at thousands and thousands of lambs? Yeah, it, yeah, it's and it's never right till you get them on the hook. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really good to have. It's easy to have opinions, and I, and I can fight you over opinions for a while. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's about knowing the genetics that you're dealing with, um, and then knowing kind of the genetic potential of the lambs that you have is what I mean by knowing the genetics. Yep, Dorsets are going to finish way lighter than uh, uh, F1 Suffolk Rambouillet cross. Yeah, uh, a white a white faced rather pure Rambouillet weather is going to finish way slower than those F1 crosses, um, and so knowing kind of what you have, making sure your deworming program is current um, has a huge effect on your yield, not yield grade yield. So that's percent of sellable meat versus live weight of the animal. Yep. Uh, and so you just, you get to know after enough time, kind of the seasonality of your grass, when you're going to get good yields off of those, off of that grass. And then what you do is you try it. So you go and you'll sort, you know, we'll think we're in good shape on this string of lambs. We got maybe a thousand lambs in this string. We'll sort a load off in 300 to town. We'll look at our yield grades. If we ended up getting a 50% yield, they're all yield grade twos. We know we didn't sort enough. And so we'll go back and ship more. If okay. we end up yielding back at 46 or 44, we'll know we sorted too many and we need to go and bottom them and put them in the feed yard and get the, to get the condition and the yield up yeah. and deworm the ones we're going to try to fatten on the grass because there's probably some paras parasite load or something that's happening. So you, that, and that brings me to another question. You do both grass fed and grain finished. Lambs. Yes. And is that kind of a, a strategy for being able to sort your lambs into areas where they're going to perform optimally to get them to that end point. So it's not like, you know, all your lambs that are born a certain month are going to go as grass fed lambs. That's a kind of a risk management strategy. Then is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Kind of, uh, kind of, it's more about, um, so people eat food year round consistently, right? But grass doesn't grow consistently year round. So if you're going to feed the customer year round consistently, you have to have ways to deliver a consistent product. Yep. And you have grass and <clears throat> grass in a feed yard or corn grain. Ours is a corn yard, but um, grain-fed lambs. 
the uh, feed yards work as an accelerator and grass is a decelerator of inventory. So you can keep livestock on grass and keep them in yield grade two or lower condition for a very long period of time. Um, whereas once you go on feed, we set a clock for 60 days and we know that we're gonna yield 50% and there are gonna be 95% yield grade twos, right? 60 days after we put them in, almost mm -hmm. regardless of condition going in. And so be because of that, we use that to stagger our inventory so we can deliver product throughout the year okay. and keep animals from getting, we do that to do that, but we also do it to keep animals from getting too old. So if you try to market 100% of your lambs born all through the grass, you're going to have a bottom end. Right. Everybody has a bottom end. And the way you finish a bottom end is by supplementing protein or supplementing energy, which is what you're doing in a feedlot. You're supplementing it with grain to, to get them to finish. And so you always have to finish that bottom end. And we have, we have animals year round. We have lambs year round. And so if we just always topped them, we would have six, seven year old sheep <laughs> that never finished because they just didn't have the genetic disposition to convert grass into right. fat cover correctly. So, um, so we do that as a balance and a hedge, a risk management strategy for ourselves, if you will. So that way yeah. we can use both tools and market on a more year round basis. Um, the other, yeah, so I did accelerator, decelerator, and then market on a year round basis. Uh, the other difference is cost. It's very expensive to feed animals corn, um, corn or grain because we in California, we have to ship it from the Midwest. Right. California uses 100% of its feed corn harvest in the first three months after harvest and everything else gets railed in. So in we're having to buy it out of Iowa and then put it on a train car and freight it all the way over. We ended up, we, well, how we get it is we get it, Foster Farms buys it, they rail it in. Then we buy it from a broker through Foster Farms and then we get it delivered up. So we probably, between our transition, we probably have three or four middlemen getting in there, getting margins before we get our corn. And so that's why California corn and feed costs are more expensive than anywhere else. Um, but because of that expense, we are naturally driven to use as much grass as we can. It's innate into the business economic health of our business. And we also believe it's good for the lambs too. We don't want to overfeed lambs. We don't want to keep them on feed more than 90 days. We try to, we keep our inventory as current as possible. And uh, I think the longest fed lamb I've ever had was um, back in 2000 and uh, there was a big crash in 09 or 10, 11, somewhere in there. And we had some lambs because we couldn't get them through the plant. We had some lambs get stretched out to like 150 days. And that was the most we've ever had. Typically we average 60 to 65 days on feed. So when you hear feedlot lamb, they spent the first six to eight months on grass and the last two on grain. So it's not, you're not, you, a lot of times when you hear confined feeding, you think they're born right. live their whole life and then leave their all of this pen. It, no, that's not what happens in the sheep industry. The sheep industry is very much a grass-based. The majority of the industry is a grass-based production model. There are some developing models in the Midwest where there is a grain-fed, 100% grain-fed diet through their, um, through their life, but that's because they have a lot of corn and not a lot of grass. So it's a product of conditions where they're at. Would you ever, this may be a really stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. In a time where you're trying to stretch things out and you get into a position where you can't stay current for whatever reason, would you ever take lambs that have gone into the feed yard and put them back on grass? No. Okay. Nope, never. You won't put new lambs in the yard. Okay. Okay. That's how you get current. That's how you stretch out. Okay. Yeah. Because once you get them on corn, if you pull them off of that corn, so they, their, their rumen adjusts when they get on the right. corn. Right. And once it's adjusted to deal with that higher protein, if you pull it off and switch it, it messes with the rumen too much and you'll cause a lot of health issues. We don't want to do that. We don't want yeah. to hurt the animals at all. We're, yeah, absolutely. If they're healthy, they do well. They gain, we, we want them to gain weight, finish well, and be a good, strong product. In order to do that, you need to make sure their nutrition is top-notch and their health is top-notch. So. I talked to, talked to a mutual friend about this in the last couple of days, Joe Fisher. And one of the things that Joe says is that you want – you want every day to be better than the last one. 
after that animal when you're trying to finish it, right? You want them on that rising plane. And I think that's a that's an important consideration. Absolutely. There's a ton of times where you get in lambs. <clears throat> we, we also custom feed lambs for different people. And uh, when we get lambs in, sometimes that first day in the feedlot is the most feed those lambs have ever seen there. <laughs> yeah. And so, that, you know, like I said, you get back to the misconception of, you know, confined feeding is bad for the animal. The animal and the health of that animal is paramount to the success of the feedlot. So Absolutely. if you're, if you're mismanaging your diet or you're messing with them too much and making them do unnatural things, you're, um, you're going to hurt the animal and you're not going to be in business very long because it's, you know, it gets back to that, gets back to that chicken example. If you stress out a chicken, an egg laying chicken, the first thing it does is it stops laying eggs. So the last thing you want to do is stress it. It's exactly. the same with trying to grow lambs and, and finish lambs. So. Do you, when you guys, when you go to buy lambs, buy feeder lambs, are you looking for a specific type of lamb to fit one market or another? Um, or um, you look, how, how does that work? Yeah. So we've, we've, um, we've been pretty aggressive in our data tracking. I, I kind of backed off the last year or two cause I got busy, but, um, busy and lazy i think i think it's more than busy but uh, busy is my excuse but um we always we we track the performance data i used to do it all by hand and we started doing it by computer and so now i have to go into the computer and review it rather than when you do it all by hand you remember it better but i um you track the performance of different producers and the way we're the way we feed we're able to do that and we really try to target feed efficient producers. So there's a lot of difference between animals as far as how well they will do, how efficiently they will convert feed into pounds. So you look at one pound of feed equals how much gain or how many pounds of feed takes to do one pound of gain are the two ratios that mean the same thing. And we track that and we try to target the more efficient feeders. So that way, because that will result in a lot more dollars um, in our pockets if we can find those feed efficient animals. Um, and the efficiency comes from a couple of things, uh, good quality health in the mm -hmm. flock mm -hmm. um, and a fair weighing condition on sale day. A lot mm -hmm. of people try to abuse the weighing condition and that will um, affect the way the gain because you got to go pay weights to pay weights and you might fill them up with water or the thing I hate the most about the sheep, <laughs> it's the opposite of what I, it bothers me about the, the, the chotis bear, the sheep industry, in the commercial side, they'll leave the tail docks too long. They'll add an extra vertebrae in there when they're docking the tails. And the theory is, well, a quarter pound a head is, you know, <laughs> money over every, but when you get paid on the, at the plant, they cut the tail off. So yeah. it's, it's a net loss on my end. And so when I go and see a bunch of lambs with, big tails on the back it makes me makes me not like them as much. <laughs> but um but yeah so it's it's kind of those things the other a fair weighing condition i think healthy lambs in a fair weighing condition are probably the two main things we look for when we're when we're buying them so so that's part of a reputation too right that, that as that's you how reputations built. are built yeah and they're not built over a year they're built over multiple years Right. So, you know, if you're doing a really good job and you, you're just starting, well, the only guy that's going to know you did a good job is that first person who bought them. <clears> right. And that first person who bought them, if they're really good, isn't going to go tell everybody, hey, these are great lambs. Everybody should bid on them. They're going to keep trying to buy them. So if you have that repeat buyer year after year after year after year after year, and they're really enjoying those lambs, um, you can always, depending on who you're selling them to, you can always talk about performance data, see if you can get anything back. And then um, if they are doing real good, the other way to figure it out is to re retain ownership and try to feed them yourself and gather the data. So, um, you know, it, but it's built over years. So you gotta, you can't do If you do it one year and then you get mad because you got bottom money because it's your first year raising sheep and selling them that's probably because it was your first year and, and it, there's a lot of unknown in those lambs, what they're going to yeah. be like. But then yeah. over years you establish a reputation and can, can uh, start to command premiums once you get to a 
reasonable reputation. And it takes, I, I'd say it takes five to 10 years. Yeah. To build a real reputation. Well, and even at our small scale with how we've evolved in our marketing, we've got people now that, that want to buy our lambs every year. And I think mm -hmm. regardless of the scale you operate at, um, those things of animal health and fair weighing conditions and, and understanding when those lambs are at their peak is, is part of that reputation too. Isn't it? Yeah. And everybody that I know, they'll talk about the people with bad reputations a lot more than they talk about people <laughs> with good reputations. That's the other thing to remember. <laughs> it doesn't take long to, to uh, ruin a good reputation. Oh no, no. man. It, it takes one, one shipment, yep. one bad story and you can ruin your 10 years of work. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So that kind of brings me to another question from a, from a feedlot perspective. You talked about getting grain and you talked about efficiency and a variety of other things. What are the biggest challenges that you face as a feedlot operator, as a, as a lamb feeder? Oh, gosh. Um, Labor is always an issue. It's just finding people to work. Um, that, that's, always a, that's always a concern. Um, sourcing the corn has been more challenging year over year. Um, it's very tempting to try to change the grain that you're using, the protein that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, a, that's always a consideration we have in the back of our head, but um, we have such a lack of, of um, commercial experienced experts in the sheep industry in general in the United States that it's really hard to um, find, um, you know, you, you, there's a lot of nutritionists, but you get a nutritionist that's going to, to give, you, give you new advice that improves the quality of what you're doing and the confidence in that nutritionist to change and see it materialize is very difficult. Yeah. Not to say they're not there, they're definitely there. And um, I mean, we, we're constantly looking and talking to new people and trying to broaden our exposure there to, to learn more about that. But it, we have a really hard time changing from the basics of what we're doing um, because of that risk. Right. Um, and there, there's a little difference too, because in the sheep industry, because the numbers are smaller, um, there's not as much uh, pressure on maximizing the efficiency of the protein in the feed or the energy in the feed. I got to use the terms right when you get in trouble, <laughs> but uh, you got to use the energy in the feed right. And so like, you don't see a lot of steam flake corn and, and we, we crack our corn and that's the max of what we do. And it, but the reason is, is because there's not, there's no, there's not a lot of feedlots out there that have the, there's not enough money in the industry to really justify those kind of investments like you see at a, right at a five rivers feed yard where they feed a million cattle a year or whatever. Right, right. You know, they're able to put the money into those, those kind of efficiencies. And it gets back to the, how you improve. You're improving your conversion ratio quarter of a pound or a 10th of a pound by doing those things. And is that really worth a hundred thousand dollar investment in a steam flaker? And then in California, are we going to have corn to steam flake in five years? Right, right. So I would imagine you're always looking, like you said, at, at those nutritional alternatives, but it, there's a risk that you're going to flip something over and making some of those changes too, right? Exactly. And that's what prevents us from doing it. And we get offered a lot of different, um, different uh, food waste type things. So the, the sure. chip manufacturers and those guys sweep the chips up off the floor and want to sell them or the brewer's grain or different things like that. We've never really felt comfortable incorporating them because the supply's a little inconsistent mm -hmm. and incorporating them correctly to not hurt the nutrition of the animal, it has us very nervous. There's, um, I know there's a couple of feed yards that, that excel at that, mm -hmm. at using those kind of things. And so it's not to say it can't be done, but in our operation, we're very nervous to um, incorporate those things because of our, you know, just our nervousness or being nervous about um, messing up that nutrition side by changing the diet. Yeah. Yeah. I want to come back um, to, to something you t started with, and maybe this is a, a good wrap up, but 
we hear a lot in our industry about the effect of overweight lambs or old crop lambs. Um, why does that happen in our industry? What, what really is the cause of that? And, and what does it do to us as an industry in your, in your experience? Oh, gosh, I could talk for six hours on this and not be right. Um, I, the, so the overweight lamb issue is more of a – so in the cattle industry, they have a publication called Cattle Facts. Right. And in Cattle Facts, in the lower left-hand corner, every single week they have a little thermometer, and it's the currentness gauge of the feed yards. And it shows you when you're current, very current, or not current. And what does current mean, Ryan, for those of us that, not in the That field. means that you, your, um, your yard is not long on feed and not short on feed. So it means you have enough saleable finished lambs to supply that week's perfect currentness is you have enough finished lambs to supply, supply exactly 100% of that week's supply need no more and no less and next week you will have exactly enough to supply that week so that's okay. currentness okay you get uncurrent you get overcurrent or undercurrent if you get overcurrent that means you are sending lambs to slaughter early if you get overcurrent you're sending lambs to slaughter wait late the overweight lamb issue is a um, it's the undercurrent so you're sending lambs to slaughter late is the problem mm -hmm. and it's not the weight as much as a yield grade the yield grade is what you need to look at to find, see if you're truly un uncurrent because some of the genetics off of the rocky mountains those lambs are built to be 190 pounds and be a solid yield grade to beautiful lamb the, the racks off of some of those Suffolk crosses out there are absolutely tremendous. So I always hesitate to just blame weight. You got to yeah. really look at that yield grade to see that. And then the flip side of that, I was going to say this in the beginning, the most expensive problem for a plant is to be too lean. Because if you're too lean, you can't sell the meat. Right. If you're too fat, you cut the fat off and sell the meat. Right. And so it comes to the problem that producers are having. What's worse, being able to, you know, sell your lambs for not a lot of money or sell your lamb or not sell your lambs? Right. And the bigger problem is being able to not sell them. And so right. that's kind of when you get too lean into plants and you get, that's a bigger problem for the industry. And so because of that, we always try to do our projections to be current. But then when you have a COVID-19 happen and, uh, plant shuts down in the United States because of some unknown virus that came in from who knows where. I mean, it, you have this giant unknown happen, all of a sudden that inventory backs up. Right. And because the inventory is tight, it happens more frequently than, uh, than in say cattle or pork or chickens, because it's a lot easier to hide uh, 10,000 cattle, you know, than it is to hide 10,000 lambs, 10,000 lambs is 20% of our weekly kill in the United States. 10,000 right. cattle is, I think that's like <laughs> a couple of days at some of the like it's nothing. Yeah, at, at a plant, yeah. Yeah, so it's really tiny. That's one of the biggest issues is our numbers are small, so the percentages get exaggerated. And the, these unknown events have a bigger um, effect. The other reason for it is we have like 85% of the Lambs in the United States are born in the first quarter, marketed in the fall as feeders, and and so then they go to a market between the winter quarter and the spring quarter. And so you're trying to do your projections from a plant. You're trying to take that inventory and you have to spread it out over the whole year, keeping it current. And right. so you have to be pretty darn blessed to be able to nail it perfect. Uh, because you're shooting out so far and there's so many unknowns that happen over a six month period. So, okay. um, but then really to me, the cure to that is understanding your um, grass systems and blending them with your corn, your feed yard. So uh, like in California, we're really blessed out here. Where we have a lot of grass, a lot of the other, you know, in the winter time, there's not a lot of grass in, in, um, in Montana. 
yeah. cats is all down in, in California and Oregon and you know, kind of the Imperial Valley, those areas. And so the yep. more products you can run on, the more animals you can run in those grassy areas during that time of year, they may be old by the time the spring comes and things get backed up, but they're not over fat. Right. And right. so that's, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to decelerate a large percentage of the animals to then accelerate them at the import at the proper times. And so that's why the feedlot complements grass so well and grass complements a feedlot. They're not in opposition to each other. It's part of a successful production system. And, and the other side of it too is each, um, each packing facility, each meat selling company has a different procurement setup and a different expertise and a different niche. And so they'll all have different setups. And so just what I have isn't going to apply to other organizations and other plants. And they, they probably don't want what we have because right. they're selling into a different market. So, but those are kind of the general parameters from where I'm sitting in California as to how this all functions, like how the feed yard fits into the production system. Well, and it, it seems to me that even without a formal grid system in the, in the lamb industry, there are some of those market signals um, sent between particular processors and their suppliers about here's the kind of lamb that really fits where we're selling, right? So, so your processor may have a little bit different priority and be willing to pay a little bit more for those kind of lambs, even though there's not this formal reported grid system like there would be in the cattle market. Yeah, I mean, it gets back to reputation and, and right. understanding your own capabilities and then delivering on those capabilities, right. whatever they are, um, and doing it consistently year over year. And the more right. dependable you become, the more dependable that product is and the better they can do negotiating those things. But once again, I, I really do think in the sheep industry, especially with COVID now, and I felt this back when we had our last crash, when we made some major adjustments in the way we market our product, it's really valuable to have a strong working relationship with who you're selling to. Because in a deal like this now with the industry contracting or you know as, as tight as it is, having a spot to go with your lambs is the single most valuable thing. Yeah. The, the price per pound is great to go talk to your friends about. It's great to brag about. It's great to make fun of your neighbor because he got a nickel more <laughs> than him. But at the end of the day, if you delivered them and got a check, that's better than a lot of guys right now. And so, <laughs> so I, I think it's really important that, that we as an industry realize this and not take such an adversarial position against the different segments of the industry and start building these relationships because it doesn't start, the industry doesn't have a meeting and everybody leaves holding arms. You know, you make a phone call and have lunch and build a relationship with someone on the other side of that phone. And that's how the, the, these relationships are built. That's how the systems start working. And the system works because one system within it's working. And then somebody copies it or does their own thing. It's, it's about making what you're working in be efficient. It's not about beating up the neighbor or beating up the next guy or, you know, it's, it's about, it's about working together and building these efficient production systems. And that's not about, you don't want to just bend over and sell things for nothing either. You've got to um, demand value for your product and have price discovery, but the understanding that it's not an adversarial trade at its heart, it, the, you know, when you're trading lambs and selling lambs, it's a complementary um, transaction. It's not adversarial at its core. And so, yeah. Well, and I think that's even true for folks that direct market. And absolutely. I, I, I think one of the things you just said is, is having that, getting that check um, is pretty important regardless of the times you're in. But, but I'm looking at our business right now. Um, I'd much rather have that check on the day after we wean our lambs when we typically sell a load of lambs than wait until January the following year to sell the last package of meat in my freezer and then trying to figure out if it, if it made some sense. So I think that the direct marketing folks really need to look um, carefully at that relationship as well. And, and, uh, and at sense. the end of it, it always gets down to risk tolerance. So I mean, we talked a lot about risk in the last couple of episodes, but yep. you know, the, 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 like the meat in the freezer and the direct marketing, um, 
you, it's all about balance and understanding the right. risk of that and then making sure that you're, you're, you're able to handle that risk. Yep. You know, analyze what it could potentially go down to and then just managing that risk properly and exposing yourself to the, um, you know, to the only to the limits of what you can tolerate rather than yep. overextending yep. yourself. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we covered lots of ground today. This is great. I, yeah, I learned, we did. It went fast. I, I can't bunch. get started up. <laughs> <You know. laughs> well, I learned a lot, Ryan. Thank you. That was, that was really, really informative. So thank you. Well, that was fun. You set the bar high. I got to come up with some different questions <laughs> for our next one. Well, this is good. We'll be back next week, huh? Same time, same place. I'll be here. That sounds good. And I am Dan Macon in Auburn, California. And you Hello. are Ryan Mahoney in Rio Vista, California. And this is Sheep Stuff You Should Know. And uh, thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you guys next week. See you, Dan. Thanks, Ryan.